Hello everyone. I know that it's a video recorded sermon again, just a couple of weeks after we had last done one, but this time was planned. It's a much more happy occasion as you saw in the bulletin. My family and I are going back to St. Mark Lutheran Church in Wallace, Michigan. They are celebrating their 100th anniversary today and we wanted to be there for that special occasion. And it's going to be a privilege and a joy to be able to see all of those former members that we served and to, to reminisce and recall our time with them there. So I think, first of all, thank uh, Lyle Menke and Dave Schultz for helping lead and conduct our service. And I invite you now to turn to page three in your bulletin as we read um, the message for our sermon. It comes from Galatians chapter two, verses 11 through 16. You can find it on page three in your bulletin if you want to follow along. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. For before some people came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when those people came, he drew back and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision group. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. With the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting according to the truth of the gospel... I said to Cephas in front of them all, If you are a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. Why do you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We are by Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What will the fallout be? I know what the person is doing is wrong. I know they are not living according to God's will. And oh, they are enmeshed and entangled in sin, and it is a danger to their soul. But what will the fallout be? How many times don't you find yourself when you want to do what is good and God pleasing, and you, you see someone who is caught and ensnared, enmeshed by sin, held captive by it, and, and you long to be able to go and to speak to that person and confront that person about it? But on your way, you catch yourself and start asking, what will the fallout be? How will the person react? How will others react? How might this come back to bite me? There are many beautiful and wonderful parts of being in a Christian church. You have brothers and sisters in Christ who are going to support you in your utmost hour of need. When you need it the most, they are going to be there to rally behind you and support you. You're going to come into contact with people you probably would never have met before and develop really awesome relationships with these people. You're going to laugh with people. You're going to cry with people. Wonderful aspects of being part of a Christian church. But then, then there's also some difficult parts too. The church is filled with sinners and sometimes these sinners become ensnared and enmeshed and captured by the sins they commit. And as fellow Christians, we are called to lead them to repent. And it's difficult. It's hard because these situations are often charged with emotion and we wonder, what will the fallout be? Our lessons today have focused on this exact and difficult topic. You heard from Ezekiel, you heard from Matthew about this important work of God's church. And now we're going to focus on a specific incident involving the early New Testament church and two of the leaders who are there, Peter and Paul, and see if we can learn on how to deal with this hard issue. 
And we hear Paul record for us. He writes, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly wrong. For before some people came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when those people came, he drew back and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision group. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all of them, If you a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. Why do you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We can unpack this story that Paul shares about the life inside of a Christian church in the important city of Antioch and why he needed to confront Peter. Peter and Paul were both in the city of Antioch. Antioch on the Orontes is a way that you can identify it. The Orontes River in the southern part of the country we call Turkey today. And Antioch became an important center in Christianity. And so both Peter and Paul were spending some time there. And they were enjoying living according to Christian freedom. Christian freedom, which said those laws, those ceremonial laws, which the Old Testament had said the Jews were supposed to live by, you were free from those. You didn't have to live according to those laws anymore. And they were enjoying this freedom until some Jewish Christians from James, which is synonymous, which is a way to say from the city of Jerusalem, came to Antioch. And it got Peter thinking, What if word gets out about the way that I am living up here in Antioch? What if that finds its way back to Jerusalem? What will the fallout be? And people here, I'm not living according to Jewish customs. And so, because Peter starts thinking and start becoming afraid, it leads him to change the way he was acting. He starts withdrawing and and not living the way that he had previously been living and started living more like a Jew rather than living with the Gentiles. And evidently, Peter's actions had some widespread consequences within the church of Antioch. So much so that Barnabas, Paul references, a man whom Paul had gone on a missionary trip with, who he had bled with, who he had been persecuted with, that even Barnabas was led astray by Peter's actions. And Paul, he was incredibly distressed by what he had seen. And it led him to confront Peter over what he was doing. Can you figure out what caused Paul so much distress? Imagine being one of those non-Jewish Christians in Antioch. You have come to know who Jesus is. You've heard the stories about him. And in those stories, you've probably heard about one of his closest disciples. In fact, maybe even the leader of that group of disciples, Peter. And what would you just naturally do to someone like Peter? You would look up to him, wouldn't you? Now you know the reason you are saved. You are saved because of Jesus and his actions for you. And you know that Jesus gave freedom, freedom to his church. Once upon a time, God had said to the Jews, you are supposed to live set apart for me according to certain food and ways to dress. But that's not the way to live separate anymore. You don't need to live like that. You are free to choose what to eat. You're free to choose what to dress in a, in a God-pleasing manner. And you know salvation isn't dependent upon these things anymore. And it never was. Because you know salvation is dependent upon 
We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. You know and you believe Jesus is your salvation and your Savior. And your salvation is entirely based on what Jesus has done for you. You love, you cherish this message, you hold it dear. But then you see a leader in the church, someone you look up to, suddenly living one way. But when other people show up, start living in the former way. What would you think when you see Peter living like a Jew when he doesn't need to? Paul knows exactly what you would think. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly wrong. But when those people came, he drew back and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision group. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. You would be confused about the clear message of the gospel and whether or not you are saved solely through faith in Jesus or not. Paul saw the real harm Peter's actions were bringing and inflicting on Christians. Peter's actions, motivated by fear, muddied the clear truth of the gospel. Paul understood this painful truth and it led him to confront Peter over what he was doing out of love for the gospel. And Paul's actions, his love for the gospel, demonstrate the reason why we approach people about their sins. We do not approach people because we want to fix them when they are enmeshed and entangled in sin. We don't want to fix them. We don't want to kick them out of the church. We aren't trying to make them presentable to Jesus before we can share the message of forgiveness with them. This is not our goal at all when we approach and talk to people about the sins which have enmeshed and enmeshed and and entangled and captured them. No, the reason we talk to others about sin is because of a love for the gospel. Does the person who embraces sin, whether it is the sin of neglecting Christ and his word, or neglecting brothers and sisters in Christ by just not coming to church, not coming to worship. Or perhaps it's the, the sin of abusing God's gift of marriage by living with a significant other before being married. Or maybe it is the, the rage-filled person who just flies off the handle at others and refuses to ever acknowledge that their words and their actions could indeed cause harm and could indeed be sin, refuses to admit wrongdoing. Do any of these people truly appreciate, in a sincere way, the forgiving nature of the gospel? By all appearances, the answer is no. Someone who refuses to give up sin struggles truly to appreciate the forgiving nature of the gospel. Clearly so. However, does this mean all well-meaning Christians, people who are willing and on fire for the Lord to go and to speak to someone about their sins and willing to say whatever needs to be said, do these people who confront others often demonstrate a clear love for the gospel? 
does a Christian who has no relationship with a person, a member of the church perhaps, and who goes up to someone who hasn't been in church in quite a long time and simply shows up and says, you're going to hell because you haven't been to church or immediately starts attacking someone who is living with someone outside of marriage or calls them a, a rage-filled jerk is this person really demonstrating a clear love for the gospel? Or what about those who are paralyzed in inaction? They know what needs to be said, but just are scared of what the fallout might be. Or the people who say, I don't want to appear that holier than thou. I don't want to appear better than you. Or what about those people who blame you or others for their sins or the sins of others? Do any of these people have a clear love for the gospel? Or are they struggling? How come? What's what's the reason? For the struggle? What's the reason for the, the lack of understanding of the clear gospel? It's because at times like these, we are allowing ourselves to be defined by our sinful nature. We are allowing ourselves to be defined by fear rather than by the gospel. So, what does it mean to be defined by the clear gospel? We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. The person who is defined by the gospel understands, yes, I have done things wrong, but I am not defined by my sin. I am defined by the forgiveness Jesus has won for me. And one of the ways as a Christian I seek to be defined by the forgiveness Jesus has won for me is I live defined by this forgiveness. I don't want to openly embrace sin. I fight against it. I struggle against it. I don't want to live in a certain way, but I also know that I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm feeble, and I'm going to fall into sin. I am going to be led astray. And so when I am this, do these things, I confess I sin. I acknowledge my sin and I look to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to me? He says, I forgive you. I love you. And he demonstrates this for us through his words and actions. He says, leave your sin behind. Don't be defined by your sin. Are you going to be perfect? No. No, not a chance. But you don't need to be. I am perfect for you. I've forgiven you. And so, now don't define yourself by, by your sin. Define yourself by me and the love of my gospel. And the forgiveness which I have won for you because your sins are indeed forgiven, Jesus says. And he says, I want you to define your actions and your interactions with others based on the gospel. Are you worried about the fallout from sin and how it might cause others to think about you, how they might react to you, worried about your own life, the life of your church? Remember, Jesus says, it doesn't change the way I feel about you. It doesn't change your status in my sight. You still belong to me. You are forgiven. And the church, it's not yours. It's mine. And if you're worried about that, remember, I put the hard work in of saving you. I am your savior. I'm not asking you to save people. I did that. 
You don't need to do it. Because when somebody rejects your you and your message, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me and my message of forgiveness, the forgiveness I won and spitting on it and treating it terribly. They're rejecting me. It's on them. It's not on you. And Jesus says, you know, I don't force anyone. I don't force anyone to come to worship. I don't force anyone to live a certain way. Instead, my forgiveness wins them over. It wins them over to make me a priority because they are just so thankful for what I have done. And when they truly appreciate it, they're not going to have a struggle getting to worship. And, and, and they're going to fight like everything to give up those sins. Because I'm going to be more important than anything else in the world to them. So why would I expect you, as my follower, Jesus says, to do anything different? And I understand you're still worried. I understand you're still going to be afraid. You're going to fall and you're going to fail. And I understand you're not perfect. The good news of the gospel is you don't need to be. You are forgiven. You don't need to be afraid. You just focus on the gospel. And Jesus says, I'll take care of the rest. Amen.